of the World Academy of Science, Royal Society of South Africa, Academy of Science of South Africa, and the member of U.S. National Academy of Science. Welcome, Marisha. Thank you very much for coming. And I see you, Pastor. Sabir Abdelkari is a South African clinical infectious disease epidemiologist, widely recognized for scientific contribution and leadership in AIDS and since two years or three years COVID-19. Uh, he is director of the Center for AIDS Program Research in South Africa, Durban, and currently is a professor uh, of global health at Columbia University, New York. He is adjunct professor of immunology sorry, and infectious disease at Harvard University, adjunct professor of medicine, medicine at Council, Cornell University, and co vice chancellor of research at the University of Washington. He previously served as president of the South African Medical Research Council. It's a big uh, research institution in South Africa, but one. He's a commissioner on both the African Union and the Commission on COVID-19 uh, and the Lancet Commission on COVID-19 is a member of the WHO TB HIV Task Force. He is a member of the Science Council of the WHO and he is president of the International Science Council. He served on the board of the New England Lancet Global Health and Lancet HIV. So his many awards include the, the Gardner Global Health Award and the Kwam uh, Nikurma Prize of the highest award for research in Africa. In 28 on of August, Sorry. he Sorry. came in Tunisia because he uh, received uh, in 28 uh, the, uh, uh, the award of Hideo Noguchi Prize for Research. And uh, he, he, he got this during the TICAT 8 uh, ceremony. And uh, he's member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. And the Academy of Medicine, he is a fellow of uh, the Royal so uh, Society. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Salim, uh, he uh, know uh, we have a common friend, uh, Arnaud Fontanet, who is member of our scientific council here in Institut Pasteur. He is also member of the, the scientific council of COVID-19 in France. And he, he, he tell him, I am going to Tunisia uh, I, and I am open and I am willing to uh, have some exchange with scientists there. So Arnaud, uh, he, he told me this, he called me and he said that if we want. And very quickly, we organized this seminar in connection, of course, uh, with uh, Karisha and Salim, with the help of Hisham, who prepared uh, the different things and prepared the the summary, etc., and we are uh, very happy uh, to welcome you uh, uh, here at Institut Pasteur of Tunis and in Tunisia. So, uh, we will start with the first presentation that will be made by Risha. Okay, so please, you, you will be both for the two presentations? Yes. Okay, good. So, welcome and uh, merci pour uh, votre attention. Thank you very much uh, for that very warm introduction and for the invitation to be uh, part of the Institute Pasteur Tunis. Good morning, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege to have this opportunity to talk to you about COVID-19 and HIV mapping a path uh, forward. And uh, I think in the past two years, uh, all of us have been uh, globally consumed with COVID-19 We've, uh, we've almost forgotten the other epidemics out there like HIV, TB, Ebola, malaria. So it's a good opportunity to look to this and, and reflect a bit on uh, how far we've gotten, where we are. And um, hmm, um, okay, I think I'm good. <laughs> 
Um, so in, just as a quick overview, what I will cover today is a, a quick glimpse of the status of the HIV epidemic as we know it, uh, challenges in HIV prevention with a particular focus on young girls in Africa. And then I'm going to talk about the impact of COVID on HIV and the impact of HIV on COVID and, uh, and, and dwell a little bit about the emergence of uh, new variants and then talk about how do we move forward with uh, both of these epidemics uh, because as epidemics go, unless we reach levels of endemicity or eradication and elimination, we continue to have them there as we are learning with poliovirus right now. So uh, in terms of the global epidemic, in 2021, worldwide, there were 38.4 million people living with HIV, despite uh, lots of efforts that I'll cover in a few minutes um, around treatment. 650,000 HIV deaths taking place each year. And of greatest concern is the one and a half million new infections. And to look at that one and a half million new infections that continue to take place each year, it's roughly about 4,000 infections each day. And um, to put Africa into that perspective of the global pandemic, we have about 70% of the global burden of HIV and one in five or 20% of this global burden is actually in South Africa, which has less than 1% of the global population. Of note is a unique feature of the epidemic in Africa, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Eastern and Southern Africa, is an age-sex difference where young women get infected between the ages of 15 to 24 years and have sometimes up to eight times more infection compared to their male peers, and I'll return to that. Now, between about 20, 2009 and 2012 was a real honeymoon period in our response to the epidemic because we discovered many new, uh, uh, new things to both treat infection and also to prevent HIV infection. And we learned that if we treat individuals who are infected with HIV, uh, not only do they have the individual benefit of survival and a good quality life uh, as with other chronic conditions, but they also prevent onward transmission of HIV. And this um, was one of the key components of the global strategy with can we treat enough people so that we can improve survival and also prevent onward transmission. And that roughly translates to this 90-90-90 um, strategy. And what 90-90-90 means is that 90% of people living with HIV know their status. And of that, 90% are linked to treatment services. And 90% uh, of those in treatment actually achieve uh, viral suppression and so prevent onward transmission of HIV. And I think across the globe, we've made pretty good uh, progress. Uh, uh, it's about 84, 87, 91. So the 1999 was the 2020 target as part of the UN goal of um, ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. So 2020 was a very important milestone. 14 countries across region, three regions achieve the 73% target by 2020. But the progress as with the spread of HIV was uneven. And there are uh, two regions particularly that are below 60%, and that's North Africa and the Middle East, and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in the past year, what we've seen is a dramatic increase um, in new HIV infections in Latin America. So in that context of 1990-90, uh, we've also seen a lot of innovation. So we've seen better drugs, with the better safety profiles, particularly the use of tenofovir alfenamide. We've seen simplified regimens uh, using dual therapy that are dolrotegravir based. And then the most exciting and most recent is for those who are virally suppressed, 
the po possibility of long-acting monthly dual injections. So shifting from a daily medication, and I think as you start to get better and feel better, you don't want to be reminded of being ill. And so these help with the uh, adherence issues in the longer term. But what we've also learned is that 1990-90 is no magic bullet. And we've seen the limitations of this treatment as prevention in terms of its translation at a population level to prevent HIV infection. There were four large universal test and treat uh, trials undertaken in Africa, in Southern and Eastern Africa. And with each of these, what we've seen is that they've had little or no impact on HIV incidence. And I think it's a reminder that quite often when we're responding to health challenges, public health challenges, it's not one single thing that's going to give us a solution. That we need uh, a multi-pronged approach, we need a granular understanding of the challenges. And what we've learned is that the antiretroviral treatment scale up is essential, but not sufficient for epidemic control and that we need to go beyond treatment as prevention. And then as you can see from this data, using the 2020 milestone um, as the as a guide po guiding point, uh, we've steadily increased the number of people on treatment. Um, and at, in 2020, we had about 28 million people on treatment. But as I showed you in um, my earlier slide, we have just over 38 million people on treatment. So we still have about a third uh, um, HIV infected people who need to be reached with antiretroviral treatment. But I think in terms of the 2020 target for prevention, which was set at 500,000 new infections by 2020, we can see what we were seeing is 1.5 million new infections. And with COVID, we've seen um, some impact and some reduction, but we continue to see far more um, new infections taking place than where we needed to be. And if we want to get back on track and on target uh, to the, reach the 2030 goals, we have to do a lot more better on prevention. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges in prevention, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, and as I said, one in four new infections in Africa are taking place in young women between 15 to 24 years. And I share with you this population-based uh, data from one district. It's one of the highest burden districts in South Africa. And what you see is a very early rise of infection in young women. Uh, if you look at the red bar, compared to the blue bars. And you see that in, if you look at the blue bars, HIV infection remains quite low compared to the red bar. But by age 20, about one in um, three women are already infected with HIV. By age 25, it's almost every other woman. And you see the steady increase by age 30, 70% of women. So this is a community-based survey where you go into a district, so it's in the general population, it's not a key, um, a key population. And you think about it where 65% of the population is under the age of 35 years, that 70% of the women are infected with HIV. Then you compare that with men, and you see around after age 25, HIV starts to increase in men, and there's quite rapid uh, catch up because by age 30, 334, about 50% of the men are infected. And what we've been able to show using phylogenetics and sequencing of the virus of recently infected individuals is exactly how the virus is spreading. And you see how men between the ages of 25, over 25, are having relationships with younger women under 25. And, uh, and typically, if there's an age difference of about 8 to 11 years, how they get infected. Some of them survive as they get to be a, over 25. They have relationships with partners about the same age. And so we have this continuous cycle of transmission. As young women enter this 15 to 24-year age group, getting infected, some surviving, having stable relationships with the smaller age difference after 25, and so that's what we need to break. 
And so the whole idea which we first established and show, showed as a proof of concept, the use of antiretrovirals by uninfected individuals can prevent HIV infection, also known as PrEP. And today, the combination of tenofovir with emtricitabine is widely used as a daily pill by, uh, and, and part of WHO guidelines. And what we see in men who have sex with men, particularly this example in San Francisco, where 70% of MSM are on PrEP, then you see a substantial reduction in new HIV infections, 43% uh, as we see here. But when we come to Africa, what we have is uneven access to antiretroviral to PrEP, one. But two, in different populations, for example, in discordant couples where one partner is negative and the other positive, we see high uptake of PrEP. And, uh, but in other populations like young women or in the general population, what we see is that um, there is interest in PrEP, but very rapid discontinuation within, three, within six months of initiating PrEP. And so adherence is a challenge. It's a bigger challenge when you're otherwise well to be taking something to keep you uninfected. And so um, ministry particularly has uh, become very much part of shaping the new PrEP landscape that is more provider dependent or less user dependent. So what we've seen is new data more recently from both MSM populations, transgendered uh, women and also cis women on the long acting two monthly injectable called CAB long uh, uh, and, uh, and then we've also seen data from the antiretroviral monthly intravaginal ring with a new drug called tepivirine. And then there's a whole range of studies that are currently in the field, which are even more promising new technologies, but they're in clinical trial. And you know, as clinical trials go, until you see the results, you can't count on that. And some of those include a monthly tablet of Islatrava, uh, others include six monthly injections, particularly Lencapova, and importantly, biologicals broadly neutralizing antibodies. We've seen some early promising data from the AM trial, and currently there's a whole range of studies that are in the field looking at combination broadly neutralizing antibodies. The sort of concept is very similar to uh, passive immunity and, and also with, with the combinations, thinking about uh, triple therapy and how it attacks different points of viral entry. And then um, also the possibility, as we have with contraceptives, of annual implants, and here is Latrava and Tenofova alfenamide trials are currently underway, including ourselves. Now move on to the impact of um, COVID on HIV services. And I think like most countries around the world, uh, in South Africa, when we started to hear about COVID-19 and started to plan for the potential wave to come, uh, we had these uh, lockdowns where people were restricted to their homes, uh, restricted travel, movement, et cetera. And, and these reduced the patient attendance at health facilities in South Africa. Uh, some because the facilities uh, were, were closed and in other instances, people were actually scared to go to a health facility thinking that, well, if I go there, I'm going to get COVID. And uh, so about... Um, what we also saw was a big impact on the first 90, which is a reduction in HIV testing and also the initiation of new ARTs. And just prior to COVID-19, many countries introduced multi-month dispensing for those who had um, viral control and therapeutic success. And so in terms of those on treatment, we saw little impact on uh, medication collection. But I think this is, was a very um, sharp wake up call and a reminder <coughs> where we had a patient who was immunocompromised, who had failure of first line therapy and had not been initiated on any second line therapy, who got uh, COVID and had persistent infection over a seven month period. And we were able to monitor this uh, particular patient and show within days and over this duration of infection 
how the COVID mutation started to emerge. And you can see this patient, how, um, how this patient was able to recreate the three key mutations of the beta variant. And so it gave us, uh, because of the molecular surveillance process we had in place, an ability to monitor these changes, a glimpse of how these variants of concern emerge by uh, in immunocompromised individuals and highlighting this impact of uh, the, the co, um, uh, exist, a co relationship between COVID and HIV and uh, putting more emphasis on getting our HIV infected patients on treatment as well as other immuno. So I just want to emphasize not just HIV patients who are immunocompromised, they many patients, but at least what we saw here and what I tried to illustrate is the importance of strengthening and not letting up on our HIV responses, particularly on treatment initiation. And we know why we get, and, and now we've all experienced throughout the world several waves. And we've seen with each wave of new COVID-19, how it's been worse than the previous wave in terms of transmissibility. And I think we had a lot of hope with vaccines. Unfortunately, there hasn't been equitable access and coverage of COVID-19 vaccines. And so we've been able to see the emergence of these variants of concern. And with each of them, what we've seen is the ability to escape immunity. And then just talking about the most recent variant of concern, the Omicron um, variant that we identified in Botswana and, and described in South Africa, and um, very uh, nicely captured in this particular uh, publication in The Lancet, uh, highlighting how this emerged, that there are some of these mutations uh, within Omicron, that we know what they do, and uh, there's a whole lot more in this 50-odd uh, mutations that have taken place. What do they mean, and, and, and what are the implications? Uh, and, and what we know that vaccines alone, while they're very important to prevent severe disease, uh, when we see mild and, 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 um, and asymptomatic infection, SLIM's presentation will cover some of the issues around long COVID, and that's our next tsunami we should be preparing for. But we've also been involved at Caprisa in terms of, uh, of evaluating different treatments, and particularly very early on, I sit on the executive um, committee of WHO's Solidarity Platforms for Treatment and Vaccines, and here we were picking up those products on the shelf available for their potential use in uh, treatment of COVID. And uh, lastly, just to close up that, you know, we have committed to, as member states, to the UN 2030 goal of ending AIDS as a public health threat. And that 1990-90 is not the apex of this mountain we're climbing. It's only base camp. If anything, the first base camp, there is a long journey ahead of us. And in that journey ahead of us, we need to be flexible. We need to be adapting our responses based on our very granular understanding of the evolving epidemic but also tap into the benefits of new innovations and technologies. So this is what our toolbox looks like in terms of how do we, what do we have available to us. And so if you're building a house, imagine if all you did was build it with nails and planks. Um, so depending on what the purpose is, where you're trying to prevent infection, what we know is that these combinations of interventions need to be need to come together to meet um, the needs. So, for example, we talk about TAS Plus here, uh, which has three key components, which is recommit to TAS, but move beyond 95, 95, 95 that we need to be advancing provider-initiated prep. We've seen products coming through. The discovery is only the first step. When we're trying to reach epidemic control, we need to get these new innovations to people who will benefit from them. And until we do that, the research, at least in my mind, is not very meaningful. And lastly, that we need to combine these methods as needed. And there are three underlying principles, which in the interest of time, I'll leave you to read. 
And then just to say in conclusion, you know, sometimes we say history has many lessons for us, but we also have a way as human beings of repeating our lessons from history. And in HIV, we learned a key lesson around uh, solidarity and that uh, captured in how AIDS changed everything. The AIDS movement demonstrates that with shared vision, shared responsibility and through global solidarity, we can change the course of history. And we've seen that in terms of antiretroviral treatment access, we have not been able to, to translate that uh, beyond uh, treatment. But global solidarity is essential for access to life-saving medication facilitated by the Global Fund for AIDS, TB, Malaria and the US Presidential Emergency Program for AIDS Relief. We also have a shared responsibility. Countries where individuals see caring for fellow citizens as important do better than those where individuals focus on themselves uh, first. And I, you know, as we look around things like mask wearing and so on, you know, it benefits you very little, but it benefits people around you. It's how much you care for people around you. And that most importantly in COVID also we've seen that no one is safe until everyone is safe. So I thank you very much for this opportunity and for your attention. Thank you. So we we'll move directly to the yeah. uh, Professor Salim to Karim, and then uh, we will have uh, some uh, time to, to have some exchange and uh, questions. Please, well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be with you here today. I have to start by saying that Dr. Hetmi didn't introduce me properly. <laughs> My introduction is one sentence. You know that famous researcher who just spoke? I'm the husband. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about COVID-19. I'm going to talk about the fifth wave beyond, and I'm going to talk about where we are. And I'll briefly touch on what is COVID-19, because it's an evolving concept. And I'm going to talk about why are we using vaccines and why vaccines are not going to be enough. And what more do we need to be thinking about as we respond to COVID-19? I'm borrowing from this picture published in Nature. In this particular article, they describe that COVID-19 is more than just an acute respiratory infection. So you know it got its name, SARS, because of the first SARS. And so this idea that it's an acute respiratory disease comes from the original SARS. But now we have a better understanding that the respiratory part of this disease is only one very small part. That literally, COVID-19 is a disease that affects the body from head to toe. And we also know that it's not just the acute illness. It's not just that we are interested in when the acute infection occurs. Now that we are in the third year of the pandemic, we have a better understanding that there are long-term sequelae to COVID-19. They are long, they, it's, it's not just an acute infection, it's a chronic persistent infection. And not infection, but disease. And we are already seeing how it impacts people in the long term. So those who've been infected with SARS-CoV-2 naturally, about 10 to 20% of them will go on to getting long COVID. In my clinic, the patients describe it as, it's like a fog, it's brain fog. I can't think clearly, I can't concentrate. But what they're describing is malaise, 
what they are describing is a bit of cognitive dysfunction. So we know that we have to be dealing not just with the acute illness, but with the long-term illness. And this long-term illness has very substantial implications. I'm sharing with you here, this is an article in Nature Medicine, that shows that if you look at patients who uh, acquired natural SARS-CoV-2 infection, and here they looked at about 153,000 people who became infected, and compared them to about 5 million controls who didn't become infected, what they showed is that there is a more than 50% increase in heart disease. And, though, and that increase in heart disease comes from heart attacks, stroke, and myocarditis. Importantly, this increase in cardiovascular risk which is one year after the actual infection occurred, that that increased risk occurs regardless of whether your initial COVID-19 was asymptomatic, was mildly symptomatic, or was severe. Now, if you just think in Tunisia about the number of people who got COVID, whether it's asymptomatically or mildly, it's in the millions. So just think about it that if you are going to see a 50% increase in heart disease, the challenges you're going to face. And these individuals who have this increased risk of heart disease, they have it regardless of baseline risk factors. In other words, regardless of whether they are smokers, regardless of whether they have a high cholesterol. So we are going to see what is best referred to as a tsunami of chronic diseases that are going to follow in the next three to five years. And that tsunami is going to follow the waves of COVID-19 infection that we have seen already. So we have to be ready. But it's not just in heart disease. Remember that the pancreas beta cells <laughs> have a very high expression of ACE2 receptors. So that means SARS-CoV-2 actually infects beta cells in the pancreas. And with that, what we are seeing is an increase in diabetes. So we're going to see an increase in heart disease. We're going to see an increase in diabetes. But here's the part that worries me. When I first saw this paper in Nature, I didn't believe it. It shocked me. This is a study from the UK. In the UK, they are doing a long-term follow-up with brain scans of thousands of people. And they do it every six months. It's just a longitudinal cohort. In this study, they looked at 401 patients who got COVID-19 between the two scans. And they compared them to just under 400 individuals who did not get COVID-19 between the two scans, and they are similar in age and gender. What did they show? They showed first and foremost that patients who had COVID-19, they had a smaller brain. COVID-19 reduces brain size. And the way it reduces brain size, it reduces gray matter thickness. So you remember from high school biology, if you haven't learned it here at the Pasteur Institute in Tunis, that the brain has gray matter and white matter. And the important part of all of it is the gray matter. That's where the neurons sit. Well, what we are seeing is between half a percent and two percent loss in gray matter. And importantly, those who lost more gray matter and had a greater reduction in brain size, they were less able to complete complex tasks. So you are now getting a sense that 
COVID-19, as we used to think about it in 2020, acute respiratory illness, hypoxemia, you've got to go to ICU, we've got to put you onto a ventilator. That problem is now a small problem. The big problem is going to be how we deal with the challenges of long COVID. So let's talk about vaccines, because we have to prevent every nat natural infection that we can. Because if we don't, you've already seen the long-term sequelae. And how do we prevent infection? Well, we have vaccines. <clears throat> there are five benefits to COVID-19 vaccines. Four of them accrue to the individual who is vaccinated. So what are those benefits? The first is that if a person has taken a COVID-19 vaccine, they will have a lower chance of getting asymptomatic infections. They will also have a lower chance of getting clinical infections. In other words, symptomatic illness they will also have a lower chance of getting severe disease, hospitalization, and death. And finally, some very early evidence from Israel suggests that there's also a possibility that vaccines reduce the progression to long COVID. So those are the four benefits of vaccination to the vaccinee. But the power of vaccines lies in the fifth benefit. And that fifth benefit accrues to everyone else by the person who is vaccinated. And that is that a vaccinated person has a lower secondary attack rate. I'm going to come back to that and explain that in a minute with two superb studies. So let's deal with one and two. And I thought I would just share with you the original Pfizer vaccine trial because it was also done in South Africa, it was done in Argentina, uh, Argentina. it was done in uh, Germany, US, and so on. So in that original first Pfizer vaccine trial, what they showed is that the vaccine not only did it reduce clinical illness by 95%, it also reduced asymptomatic infections by 66%. So it's not that it reduces clinical illness, so you get more asymptomatic illness, it prevents both. That means you are not getting COVID-19 when you are vaccinated. But we know the problem. The problem is that as you're dealing with new variants, the vaccines are not as effective anymore. Variants, by definition, are mutations that are adaptations. When the virus is adapting to humans, it's adapting to vaccine immunity. And so when you look at the five, two doses is 95% effective against the D614G variant. But it's only 75% effective against the beta variant. It was a little bit better against Delta, running at around 88% protection. But against Omicron, dips down to 67%. But if you were vaccinated six months ago, four months ago, vaccine immunity wanes quite rapidly. There's almost no protection from vaccination against Omicron, especially BA4 and BA5. Those are wily escape artists. They think nothing of vaccines in terms of creating uh, acute symptomatic illness. But the vaccines do something else. If you take a booster dose, if you take a third dose, you can improve your protection against Omicron. So that's one of the reasons why I assume in Tunis, you're also giving people a protection, another third dose. Israel is giving, I think, the fifth or sixth dose. Uh, but basically, if you give three doses, that's pretty good going. But it's not just in asymptomatic infections and clinical infections. Vaccines, regardless 
of which vaccine you take, regardless of when you took it, regardless of the variant, all vaccines do really well in protecting you from severe disease. They protect you from getting the hypoxemia, the, the, the needing to go to the ICU and needing to get admitted to hospital. How good are they? Well, I'm sharing with you here data from the New York State. This is a study of 8.8 .8 million people where for the three vaccines they use in New York, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the J&J, &J, all do superbly well, all with protection levels in the 80 to 90% range. So vaccines are really good in preventing severe infections. And if you look at the data on death in the US, <clears throat> a person who is unvaccinated has a 78 times higher risk of dying from COVID than someone who has taken three doses of the vaccine. This is very early data. I won't dwell in on much on it because it's not really been shown in multiple settings yet. This comes from a study done in Israel that shows lower progression to long COVID. But here's the power of vaccines. This is a terrific study. For those of you who are students of vaccination, read this paper. It's in the Journal of Science. In this study, what they did was they took families in which both parents were vaccinated. And they took families in which both parents were not vaccinated. And they looked at when a parent got infected. And you know that even if vaccinated, a small proportion will get infected because vaccines don't provide 100% protection. If a vaccinated parent got infected, they compared the infection rate in their children who are not vaccinated. And they compared it to the infection rate in children where the parents got infected but were not vaccinated. And what did they show? When a parent is vaccinated, they reduce the risk of infection in their children by 72%. Being vaccinated, means you are protecting everyone in your home. So in this study, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they extended that. Here, they looked at almost 150,000 contacts of infected individuals. And they compared those individuals who were vaccinated and got infected, and those individuals who were not vaccinated and got infected. What did they show? For those individuals who had two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, there was a 68% lower risk of passing it on to others. And the others, they showed that, remember, that's reducing the risk by two thirds. And that decreased risk occurred in people in their households, people who just came to visit them at home, it occurred in people where they had events in, they went to a, a meeting or they went to a wedding with them, or people they worked with, or people they were studying with. So they showed the benefits of vaccination in all of these different settings. So what we see is a very powerful set of benefits of vaccination, not just to the vaccinee, but also to everyone else they come into contact with. So the question I'm often asked, but I've had COVID-19, do I need to be vaccinated? The answer is most definitely yes. You need to get vaccinated. Why? Because if you are vaccinated, you reduce your risk of reinfection by 82%. Now that's a powerful benefit because you do not want to get reinfected. So reducing your risk through what is called hybrid immunity by 82% is a powerful benefit. But how powerful? Reinfection is not harmless. So in this analysis, if you look at that's the risk with only one infection. If you look at 
The red bar, that's the risk with two infections. And the blue bar with three or more infections. It doesn't matter which of these you want to look at. That's for argument's sake. Take the first set of bars. Can you see that as far as cardiovascular disease is concerned, anybody who's had two infections has a higher risk of heart disease than somebody who's had one infection. So you can see there is a benefit to not getting reinfected. So let me end off with what's next in COVID-19. <clears throat> there is a lot we know about COVID-19. But equally, there's a lot that we don't know about COVID-19. So let me show you, for example, one thing we do know about COVID-19. So I was asked uh, to comment uh, by a journalist uh, writing for Bloomberg. And this was in September last year. She asked me, you know, when is, is there going to be another wave? Is there going to be a fourth wave in South Africa? And if there is going to be, a, when is it going to happen? I refuse to answer the question. I said, if you want that, you know, go to one of those ladies in a tent where they look at the crystal ball and they'll tell you when the wave is coming. But I said, if you use high school mathematics and understand the wave behavior, what it says is that if the past trend continues, the fourth wave will occur in South Africa it will start on the 2nd of December. That's what I said. She wrote it down. It's published in the article. I said, oh my goodness, now I'm in trouble. Well, on the 2nd of December last year, the Omicron wave was declared in South Africa. So you can imagine the trouble that has caused. In social media, I am the one who is making the virus in my laboratory <laughs> and spreading it. How else could I have known it's coming on the 2nd of December? So Newsweek had to go and do a fact check just to make sure that I was correct and what I said was correct. But my point is, it's predictable. In the same way, I predicted the fifth wave would occur on the 8th of May of this year. And just high school mathematics that allow you to figure out the, the, the trend. Well, I was off by one day. The BA5, BA4 wave in South Africa was declared on the 7th of May. When is the next wave in South Africa? Well, it's coming. It's going to come in September. If the trends continue, always on the proviso, if the trends continue. But I want to make one point that one thing is predictable, that with each new variant, it is going to spread faster. Because no variant was ever killed or beaten. None of the variants. Beta variant, Delta variant, all of these variants are still around. When we do sequencing, I'm sure you're finding the same here in, in Tunisia, when we do sequencing in South Africa, we still have alpha variant, we still have delta variant. But the trouble is they are snails. They are spreading so slowly that they have no chance because Omicron, that's a speedster, right? That's a V8 engine purring away and it's infecting people so fast that there isn't anyone left to get infected with delta anymore. But Delta is still around. So we can expect that whatever the next variant is, and technically it's going to be called Pi, capital letter P, small i. That's the next Greek alphabet after Omicron. Remember when we first announced Omicron, you saw Croatia showed you the Lancet article. That was the first ever paper on Omicron. We wrote it at the request of Richard Horton, the editor, about four days after we originally announced Omicron. So you can imagine how fast information flow is and how much faster Omicron is. When Pi comes along, that's going to be supersonic speed, if it ever comes. 
because when it comes, it will have grown in an environment of immunity. It will have the ability to escape immunity. Almost certain. It will be, if it can't escape immunity, it will never become pi. So let me end off with, <clears throat> this means that we have to look at the response in terms of the three eras. The first era of our response, and you know, I chaired the South African Government Scientific Advisory Committee on COVID. I chaired the African CDC Committee. I'm, I've been advising dozens of governments on COVID-19. When you look at COVID-19, you think about how we responded originally, we used our, literally our bare fists in public health measures. What did we do? We did lockdowns. We made people wash their hands. Who's still washing your hands, by the way? I do. Uh, wearing a mask. I'm wearing a mask. Uh, and social distancing. But when we went into 2021, we were more keen to get vaccines. And of course, we've already heard about the challenges we've had in vaccination. But getting those vaccines was critically important, and that was era two. Our focus was on vaccination. And I've already told you about the five benefits of vaccines. If pi comes along, vaccines are not going to be good enough. We are going to need treatments. Fortunately, we already have at least one good treatment. It's called Paxlovid or Nirmaltrovir. It's boosted with Ritonavir and it works reasonably well. In fact, in Europe and in the US, the standard of care for COVID-19, if you are diagnosed and if you are elderly, 60 plus, automatically you will get the five-day course of Paxlovid. What does Paxlovid do? It reduces your risk of severe disease by 90%. That's what it does. The future of how we respond will not depend solely on vaccines anymore. It will depend on our ability to test people and to treat them. So test and treat is the way that we're going to get. I want to just end off with, but don't write off vaccines. I'm borrowing this article from Nature because we have to develop pan-coronavirus vaccines. What is a pan-coronavirus vaccine? You take all of the variants and you take the conserved epitopes, the conserved parts of each of them. What is in this virus that couldn't change across all of the variants? You make your vaccine on that. And that's what's being done. They, are uh, at least two groups, Walter Reed is the most advanced, who have developed a vaccine that's a pan-coronavirus vaccine. What does that mean? That means they're trying to make that vaccine variant-proof. They're trying, they're trying to make a vaccine that it doesn't matter what the variant is, that the vaccine would still work. We don't, we don't have it right now. We don't even have a candidate right now that's worth talking about. But that's where the future lies, that when we get into era four, we will be talking about pan-coronavirus vaccines. On that note, I hope I've given you a good feel of COVID-19. <laughs> I hope I've given you acute infection. I hope I've given you long COVID. I've shown you benefits of vaccines. And I've told you about test and treat. Thank you very much. So please, questions, okay. Yeah, please. Two questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, I guess. Just to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. I have a small question concerning the benefit of the vaccine. And uh, maybe uh, my question is, uh, 
all the faculty that we will be able to describe. I mean, faculties that depend on the age. The older you are, the older you are, you have more this type of faculty. What would be the benefit of, uh, of the vaccine in the case of Africa, where you have a really young population, which is more susceptible to this type of faculty? And compare it to doing nothing and letting the spread of the, 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 the virus, knowing that you have mutations that leads to virus less uh, dangerous. Less Thank you. Sure. So I need to start by explaining with something I didn't do. Long COVID is not a phenomenon of the elderly. Long COVID occurs regardless of age. So whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you have asymptomatic infection, whether you have clinical infection, doesn't matter. Long COVID goes across all the different age groups. It has not been clearly described in those who are below the age of 18. So in the very young ones, we don't see it in the classical sense and hasn't been well enough described. But everybody over the age of 18, if you've had COVID-19 infection, between 10 to 20 percent, regardless of age, will get long COVID. So long COVID, unlike severe COVID, which is dependent on age and comorbidity, long COVID occurs across the board. We don't know what causes long COVID. Some hypotheses say that it's a reservoir of virus or it's a reservoir of immunogen from the virus. In other words, dead parts of the virus. Because remember, it's an RNA virus. There's another school of thought, which I used to belong to, but I'm rapidly getting disabused of that. And that is that it's an autoimmunity. That there's some immunogen in the virus that the body is recognizing and cross-reacting to your natural uh, cells. As you know, that's, for example, occurs with cardiolipin. That's how you get dramatic disease, for example. And then there's a third school of thought, which is not autoimmunity, but that there's an immune reaction that continues in the long term. So we don't really know which of those is the basis of long COVID. Probably all three might be contributing. In relation to the question of, should we just allow people to get naturally infected? I had to deal with this debate with the Barrington Declaration uh, supporters. This was back in April of 2020. Their philosophy was, just let the virus spread. Let people get natural immunity. Well, we did let the virus spread in some places and we didn't in others. Regardless, we're dealing with over 6 million deaths. Is that how we want to be managing a pandemic? By allowing 6 million people to die? No. We want to do our best to try and prevent infection. We want to do our best to try and prevent long COVID. So for all of those reasons, I would never recommend that people should just allow themselves to get infected. And by the way, you know, when I showed you the slide on reinfection, that slide on reinfection and increase in heart disease occurs regardless of age. So you definitely don't want to get natural infection. Okay, let's keep it. I have a question on, on the long COVID and if there are any differences between the different variants. The so there was a paper published that suggested that Omicron was associated with much less long COVID. That paper has now been shown not to be correct. Well, actually, let's just say there's been differing evidence that's emerging. So the article may still be correct, but there are now two others that suggest differently. 
I think the one thing that is becoming clearer is that if you get infected naturally, and if you get very mild or asymptomatic infection, the immune response is very weak. And so you get rapidly waning immunity. If you get really sick, then you get really good immune response. Then you are protected against future infections. But if you get mild infection, you don't get the same benefits. And whether that applies to long COVID, at this point, the evidence doesn't suggest that. Suggest that long COVID, you are likely to see across the age groups. I think we have to go. I'll take one last question for Croatia and then I'll. So, uh, to the long term COVID 19, uh, can you compare to the reality that is the concept of the reactivation of the long term COVID 19? I have uh, spent 35 years studying RNA viruses, in particular retroviruses. And retroviruses are able to integrate into human DNA. And the reason they can do that is they carry their own reverse transcriptase. If you're not sure what I'm saying, talk to the head of virology, she'll explain it to you. But basically, the human body doesn't have the ability to convert RNA into DNA unless the virus carries that enzyme itself. HIV carries that enzyme itself. That's why HIV causes a long-term reservoir. SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have that enzyme. So we don't see the creation of a latent reservoir. But some have argued that there will be, because the human body has RNA, that there may be bits of RNA that are become part of a reservoir in cells. There are two papers in Nature that argue on either side of this debate. I wasn't sure which way to go. I asked my good friend Shane Crotty to tell me what he thinks. Because if we are seeing RNA in this way, we'll see reactivation of T cells. And Shane tells me he doesn't see it. So I don't know if that's any indication, but for now we're not seeing reactivation from initial infection to RNA uh, fragments, according to Shane Crotty. And if you don't know who Shane Crotty is, just do a search. He's the world's leading scientist on T-cell immunology and COVID. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, since we have uh, this video now, we stop and finish. And again, thank you and thank you very much for Thank you.